It's good. It sounds good. All right. So, so, so those of you who've been around the channel a long time will remember <laughs> this fella. And he's actually got a playlist, so I'll put this in the playlist. So if you find the playlist, you can go back and see our our first conversations. This is Nathan Jacobs, and uh, how how should how how should how do you want to introduce yourself? What what exactly are you, Nathan? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's say, let's let's do this. I'll, I'll say I'm a I'm an artist turned scholar of philosophy and religion uh, turned filmmaker. And uh, so all of those things are still true of me, still create art. And you can see some of it behind me here. Um, and I use that in a variety of ways, mostly these days, in, you know, commercial ways related to movie making. But, um, you know, I have done stuff, private collectors or illustration, things like that. Um, but uh, I left art school to go on this long journey of exploring big questions, God, the afterlife and things like that. And we talked actually in one of the one of my early appearances yeah. about how that was catalyzed, yeah. how that journey was catalyzed. Um, and that journey was really driven, you know, not so much by any interest in a career in academics. I would have been the least likely candidate uh, at the time to, to, to have a career uh, in any sort of scholarship. But the drive for, you know, behind those questions really sort of compelled me, propelled me forward in ways that led to, you know, all sorts of degrees in philosophy and church history, systematic theology, historical theology, art, all that. Um, and, uh, and culminated in, in the fact that I did become a professor of philosophy and religion. I uh, had a very successful, you know, publishing career. I've, I've got, you know, three books with a fourth on the way. Uh, I've got, you know, 30 plus refereed articles and things like that. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty well known in certain circles, like, Kant scholarship or even Eastern patristic metaphysics. And that ultimately led me into Eastern Orthodoxy, right? So all of that, you know, that long multi-year journey is kind of an enemy of Christianity in many ways. And then eventually uh, discovered the Eastern Church Fathers that led me down uh, the path of Orthodoxy. But along the way, I was also dabbling in a variety of different things related to art, right? So uh, while I was doing my grad work, I worked in the video game industry uh, and I did concept art and storyboarding and, you know, CGI cutscenes and things like that, which then all of that led me to interact with film people. Uh, so there are a number of folks moving around the country because of different tax incentives at the time um, where different states were trying to draw, you know, business out of out of, you know, California. And so I was bumping into them in Michigan and Chicago, you know, wherever it was. And, uh, and so through that, I was fascinated at how many of them didn't care whether I went to, or to film school, right? They only cared about my talent. So being able to do concept art, storyboard, pre-visualization, things like that, a lot of them were very willing to work with me. And so I started dabbling on the side with film, right? I did a little short film. I raised uh, funds to do, uh, you know, an independent feature film, you know, in the summers and all that bootstrapping the whole thing. And then eventually I was approached um, about doing a documentary, which I think that was the first thing you yep. ever saw from me before we met. Yep. Um, which oh, actually, was, I saw you with the uh, with the um, you did this talk for a group of clergy. That's right. Right. The Midwest. Uh, yeah. The Midwest clergy convocation. Um, I think that was in Chicago. Yep. And they put and, it up on yes. YouTube. Yeah. So they, they ended up, yeah. So they ended up bringing me out because of that documentary. So I'd done a documentary on the religiously unaffiliated or the nuns, the worst branding ever, since everybody thinks you're talking about Catholic nuns. And then they're like Catholic nuns who don't believe in God. I don't understand. Um, sounds but, great. Uh, it sounds great. Right. Um, they're sociologists, not marketing people. So yeah, I mean, you, you, you can give them a little slack on that. Anyway, um, my documentary was on the religiously unaffiliated and it was very sympathetic because that's where I came from, right? And I wanted to offer a different sort of perspective on the one hand to, uh, to folks who maybe aren't, have never, you know, disassociated from religion and they're wondering what's going on with my kid or with this other person I know. And so I wanted to offer an insight into that world and, and what those folks are really like. Um, and obviously there's a spectrum, but I wanted to offer that sort of sympathetic portrait. And at the same time for the religiously unaffiliated, I wanted to offer them a, a glimpse down the road that just because you've dissociated from religion doesn't mean you are forever 
you know, without religion, your journey might lead you back like it did for me. Um, and so that was the documentary I did. And then you're right, the uh, Midwest clergy convocation asked me to come and do a series of talks on, on the religiously unaffiliated, on the nuns, um, in order to talk about worldview, how do you engage them? You know, what do they think? All that sort of stuff. Yeah. And that was, that was the uh, one you commented on. And then, then we hopped on the phone and chatted and, you yep. know, the rest is history. Here we are. Um, so anyway, but going back to my journey, right, with in, in terms of, you know, s artist to scholar, then to filmmaker, um, after doing that documentary, I was, uh, I was at a showing of it, and it was a showing specifically for different philanthropists. And some of them were rather fascinated with what I was doing with film, you know, the fact that I'm this orthodox guy who's also a philosopher and an artist, but now I'm making movies and things like that. And so um, I was, you know, I was approached well, really sort of in tandem. On the one hand, the Metropolitan, uh, you know, of the Antiochian Orthodox Church had watched the screening of the documentary with me, and he asked me to consider leaving film, right? Uh, or leave, I'm sorry, leaving, you know, my professorship, leaving uh, a scholarship, not scholarship, leaving teaching in order to, uh, in order to do film. He was, I was sitting there <laughs> with him. He's like, I am, I am obsessed with what you have done here. You need to keep on. I need you to make films, right? And I said, uh, <laughs> "Will you pay me for that, Your Eminence?" He said, "No, but I will pray for you." You know, and uh, <laughs> I said, "All right." Well, and then I was in this gathering with these philanthropists and things like that who were intrigued, and so that started some conversations with uh, prospective investors who were willing to, you know, take a bit of a gamble. I was in development on what seemed to be a very commercial project. I'm convinced it still is, uh, but it's still in development all these years later. Um, but I, I started to work on that one, and that one opened up a lot of different doors for networking. Got me into, you know, I, I ended up sitting down in Lionsgate's headquarters. I was meeting different, I met, you know, the head of and worked with the head of uh, Walden Media. I, was, I met uh, this, this fellow, Sean Devereaux, who is a big visual effects guru. Um, who is now moving into producing and, and all that. And um, anyway, that, that ultimately opened up a host of different doors that led to an opportunity to actually officially leave behind, you know, the entire sort of academic world, uh, at least in terms of a, an employment, uh, in an employment sense, and start to do films. And so um, basically for the past couple of years, I've had a first look deal um with uh essentially it was it was initially it was initiated by lionsgate and a couple of its subsidiaries moving forward it's now um basically you know moving forward in conjunction with amazon studios and so my job throughout that early evolution i was one of the first hires that they made in terms of you know content creators and uh i signed on to basically sit there and pitch ideas and work on projects and anything they like they you know they contract for development and you know, see if it moves into creation and things like that so the past couple of years that's that's what i've been doing uh at least on the film side but as i said i still do scholarship i've got a forthcoming book on liveness on the problem of evil i still you know do stuff with art sometimes in the film but also sometimes outside of that uh so i would say you know, if anybody's played Dungeons and Dragons, I'm a triple class, right? Artist, <laughs> scholar, filmmaker, but, uh, you know, which is, you know, it's a lot to juggle, but at least right now, it seems like maybe it's converging into something coherent. <laughs> well, and then we, and then we met up again. I mean, we had a couple of conversations and you got busy with stuff and then life went yeah. on for both of us. And then we go to this art conference and, right. oh, we're going to both be at this art conference. And that's right. <laughs> and neither of us, I think, quite understood exactly what we were doing there. <laughs> but well, 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 let's let's hang out a little bit and uh, yeah. get reacquainted and catch up and see what's going on. So, um, and then a lot of a lot of thoughts during the conference. That seems like a long time ago now. It does. Um, it feels like ages ago. It does. Any any well, we can talk about that a little bit. Then then I want to pick up where we were just kind of talking about because the we seem to well maybe we'll jump into this we seem to be at an inflection point in terms of film and public art mm. the um 
you know what what lord of the rings got going and marvel ran into the ground mm -hmm. um as that that arc has seemed to have sort of set now with dune there's a question you know is is dune going to become a new star wars you know i i kind of doubt it um mm -hmm. i think it's a little too dark for for most people but and then we were talking about we were talking about sort of direct to public art right Mm -hmm. Which, of course, for me, I stumbled into this thing because I made some videos about Jordan Peterson, and I'm still not exactly sure what I stumbled into because I don't really see myself as a content creator. I've <laughs> I've been more of a conversation partner for sure. for people who want to do stuff. But now you've, you're, yeah, you're sort of a triple class. When you look out at movies, and of course now streaming is a big thing, what and 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 we seem to be at I mean, it seems like every 30 or 40 years the industry sort of hits a corner and a brick wall and mm -hmm. doesn't know how to get out of it. And maybe the beginning of this current iteration was Lord of the Rings and the end of it was Rings of Power. <laughs> it sort of bookended. Um, they do bookend, that's right. <laughs> so when you look out at the, at, at well, at the, at the question of film, because there's, of course, popular and art mm -hmm. and the interesting relationship between them, what, what are you seeing as 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 sort of where the culture and art are sort of sitting right um well i i'd say a couple of things uh, i i do think you're correct that hollywood goes through these cycles and then it all starts to converge in a certain place where everybody's doing the same thing everybody's out of ideas um and it's in a rut and and the audience gets you know audience it starts to to be disappointed uh, to put it mildly, you know, discontent and Hollywood is, is flailing to try to find the next big thing. Um, but you know, it's, it's funny. I remember meeting a producer at the first film festival I ever went to. And, uh, he, we were, we were talking through different pitches and ideas and things like that. And one of the things that he said is he said from the outside, Hollywood is innovative, the risk taking, right. They're, uh, they're <laughs> anyway, he gave a series of these these descriptors and then said, but from the inside, they, they have no creativity. There's no innovation. They're risk averse. They want to find something that worked once and they want to duplicate it and, you know, just manufacture it. And, uh, and so you start to see that. Right. And, and I think one of the things that you saw was part of the rut that we're in right now is just IP, right? Everything is about find a book that worked and buy it. Right. You know, find a show that worked in the eighties and remake it. Right. Shine shoot, we'll find a, an action figure that didn't even have a show. And we'll turn that into a show, a board game. Sure. Let's turn a nostalgic board game into a thing. So everything is about just recycling, finding some IP that has some nostalgic value or has some built in audience and just, you know, manufacture something with a little bit of a, you know, fresh twist on it. Um, so that's part of what's going on. Um, I think you're also starting to see that in the, the, the manufacturing turn, we're hitting a point where we're at the end, so end of an arms race. So with the streamers, you know, streamer, streaming was a, like a thing where people are like, really, you're going to stream stuff. And if you've never watched the, uh, the documentary, the last blockbuster, it's worth a watch because you'll see the way in which, you know, Netflix actually, you know, went and tried to strike a deal with blockbuster and blockbuster basically laughed him out of the room. Like that's absurd. <laughs> Right. And now we're all like, oh, yeah, Blockbuster. I remember that. Right. <laughs> and Netflix is the big thing. Anyway, there's more twists and turns to that story. Um, there's other reasons Blockbuster went under, but nonetheless. Uh, but the point is, like, once streaming became obviously the new thing, you know, and people's viewing habits were going to change, there emerged this arm race of arms race of how do we you know, which one, which one, obviously people aren't going to subscribe to five streamers. That would never happen. That's crazy. They're going to subscribe, they're going to subscribe to one or two. So let's just do this like 
massive, spend billions and billions and billions on content to see if we can outspend the other guys and they'll collapse and we'll be one of the last ones standing. And then we can sort of contract our spend and, and make up for it. And unfortunately, that didn't really pan out. You know, most of the streamers that were in the arms race are there and the number only seems to be increasing. And so, um, and, and yet at the same time, that's creating a little bit of a crisis in a couple of ways. One's it's creating a financial crisis where all the streamers are having to contract because they need the business model to work and an arms race only works until the guys collapse. And right. so there's a, a bit of a financial crisis there going on in terms of content. It's also a bit of a crisis in terms of the amount of content that you need in order to keep viewers present. And then also with that, one of the things that's interesting, and I, I know this from you know talking to inside managers and things like that, I don't know how public any of this information is, but um, a lot of the streamers and people like that are starting to look to movies again, because what they're realizing is that even if you spend gobs of cash, you're spending 5 million, 10 million an episode, whatever on a show, um, it really doesn't move the needle in terms of profit. It just keeps people present and subscribing. So you're still sort of just breaking even in terms of that spend. You're not, you're not making any profit. Um, and what you really need is like a stranger things hit, right? In order to draw, draw people in. Uh, and increase your numbers. And so all of a sudden they're like, well, maybe movies weren't such a bad idea, right? You know, you can go out and you, you actually make a profit on those. Uh, so there's a lot of shift like that. So on the one hand, there's this sort of financial side of, um, you know, this need for content and the financial crisis. And the result is also that what you end up having is depleting returns, right? You're, you're having to make it economic in order to make a show um, and the economics for writers and people like that, you know, those were front and center in the recent writer's strike because it used to be, you know, there weren't that many television shows. So if you could get on one, you could not only make a decent living off of it, but you could also work your, get your way onto set and become a showrunner. There was, there's a way of climbing the ladder. Whereas now they'll just throw together writers in a room and, and, you know, the, the pay isn't always that great for the writer and they're always hunting for, you know, for new shows and, and that sort of thing. So all of a sudden there's these depleting op opportunities, depleting returns. And for that reason, you also have depleted incentive structures for a lot of the writers. And so you start to get formulaic, you know, not so great stuff uh from you know these these places that just need to keep up uh keep up on 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 content creation I remember hearing a story about um this was I'll, I'll i'll hide the names but there was one of these major streamers that was putting out an inordinate amount of content within a larger universe of content and uh and one of the producers you know checked in and said how's that how's that one movie going within that universe and his response was i don't even know i'm on 12 shows <laughs> 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 right it was it, it was that sort of thing right they started filming and they didn't even have a script you know that sort of level of stuff so there there's there's this this problem of you know being able to produce high quality art at that level you're really sort of now in the manufacturing business uh, with de depleted quality now to take that just that piece of it you know put aside all this sort of ideological you know sort of stuff that's going on and all that stuff that folks complain about just just take that piece of it and contrast it with like the making of the lord of the rings if you've ever watched the behind the scenes you know back back when we bought like Blu-rays and DVDs, you know, they had all of that, you know, hours and hours and hours of behind the scene content. I watched all of it. I loved all of it. And it's amazing the level of care they took with that show. The fact that you would have, you know, it wasn't just like Peter Jackson obviously approached it in a way where he was a respecter of the source material. You can disagree with certain things he did with the source material. That's fine. But it's unquestionable that he cared about and respected the source material and considered it a privilege for him to be touching it in any way. And he wanted to pay respect to Tolkien and, uh, and, and to the fans of Tolkien, right? And so you had that, but you also then he brought in people and he had a budget and permission and a timeline 
is rarely ever granted in Hollywood anymore. And I don't know that it'll ever be granted again. Um, but he had an opportunity there to hire artists and give them the room and the latitude to be artists. So you actually had people thinking about, well, what is the different sort of, you know, signature, you know, calligraphy style of this group versus this group? How should this group, you know, given what we know of them, what should their armor be like versus this group over here, right? What is their architecture like? And there's minute detail to the point that you, you listen to costume designers and they're talking about, well, there's this embroidered thing in here where I imagine that, you know, Aragorn would have kept this sort of thing. Will anybody ever see this on camera? No, but it doesn't matter, right? It's part of actually building this world, right? In a, in a real sort of way. And that level of care is part of the reason those movies felt so layered, right? Tolkien's world feels layered. Obviously, if, if you're familiar with Tolkien's work, I mean, the books themselves are obviously layered, but things like the Still Meridian and just looking at the way Tolkien built the languages and the culture and the backstory and things like that, it's, it's in some ways, I would, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I can think of another piece of fiction that is so deeply layered in terms of world building and preparation. Um, there may be such examples, but, you know, for myself, that's the one that comes to mind is, you know, one of the deepest forms of fictional world building and, and Peter Jackson and all of the hundreds of artists around him were actually permitted to do the same level of world building such that when you see it on the screen, it doesn't look like some plastic CGI, let's pretend it's deep and rich. It genuinely looks like a built layered world reflective of Tolkien's world. Um, and that's where I look at that and I'm like, that's a work of art, right? This is, this is actually a work of art. This is not manufacturing. Um, but you can't do that without a studio taking that kind of risk, giving that sort of timeline, giving that type of latitude. Um, and like I said, when you're in an arms race, when you're in a manufacturing culture and things like that, that all goes away. And so then you get something like rings of power where the creators don't respect the source material, whatever they might say, they don't respect the source material. They don't respect the fans. Um, and they're more concerned about, you know, using it as a vehicle for their own ideas and their own ends, uh, Tolkien be damned. And uh, in terms of building the world, even though they have 50 million an episode, they still have to manufacture it in an insane speed where it's not gonna allow the level of care. And why would it? Get, be given that level of care if you don't care about the source material or even understand the source material in the first place. Um, so I, th I do think, you know, that's a big part of what's going on there. Um, and that's on the art versus manufacturing level. There's obviously other things that we could talk about, um, you know, in terms of, you know, depleting worldview and depth in terms of creators and writers too, but um, at least well, on the art versus manufacturing. Well, level, I think, I think, I think that's you. where I want to go. So when we were sitting through ARC, at least until we got to the Bishop Barron speech and the Jonathan Peugeot speech, you mm -hmm. kept, you were, you were a little frustrated with some things. It's like, are, are we, are we going to talk about nominalism here? And, <laughs> and of course I thought, I, I don't I don't know that when they sat together and they're putting this thing today, all right, putting this thing together, they said, we really want to address nominalism. <laughs> I don't think I don't <laughs> think that came up in the uh, creative no. process of putting the conference together. Yeah, in fact, it did come up. Bishop Barron did bring it into the room. And yeah. in, you know, when you have a civilizational crisis of art, mm -hmm. partially because the and I think you framed it well, because of the manufacturing interests. I mean, manufacturing in the modern is, you know, we don't care. In in fact, economics talks about widgets. Widgets are the ultimate nominalist icon because they are nothing. They mean nothing. <laughs> All we yeah. care about is the multiplication of them, whatever it may be. There is nothing there. And the, the crisis of art can, continues to, well, that they want to manufacture it. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty, of course, is that, well, um, actually, human beings create art, and mm -hmm. that uh, a, a human being that can create art 
must be formed and nurtured. And we we sort of think about formation as manufacturing, but it really isn't. It's much more of a, um, I don't even know what word to pick, but you know where I'm going. Um, right. And that, and that, of course, is because right before this, the reason I wanted to turn the camera on is we were talking about you know Hollywood in Hollywood is a, an industry it yeah. is a it is a content industry and that language says everything you need to know mm -hmm. yes the difficulty that they of course are facing is that they want people the more content gets created mm -hmm. the more cloying it all becomes and the more people you know, I, I, I watch, so now, you know, I have, I get, I get a certain, I get a certain streaming service with my phone. Of mm -hmm. course, there's a certain streaming service I have to keep paying for because members of my family continue to use it. <laughs> and then, so, you know, so now I've got all these streaming services on my TV, most of which members of my family don't know how to find the other ones, even though they're all on the screen. And if we, they're like, Oh, I want to watch that thing again. Go find it for me. But when I just hand them the remote, I'm just watching them just cycle through content, content, right. content, content. And I'm yeah. thinking, wow, used to be you just turn on the TV and you had, you know, uh, less, you know, channels like <laughs> five of them and you watched right. whatever was on. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is a... The, the art crisis in the culture is deeply connected with this. Mm -hmm. And now part of what has been happening is that with technological innovations such as Zoom, YouTube, we're even more awash in content, yet every now and then something glimmers out of the, right. out of the pile. Right. And it is a large pile. It is I a mean, large I pile. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat down and thought, boy, I'd like to watch something. And after an hour of going through thumbnails, I'm like, I'm not watching anything. Because uh, I use this entire hour just to see all the thumbnails. And I'm sure I haven't even finished them all. Anyway, um, no, I think this is actually an interesting uh, dynamic, exactly what you're talking about. And one of the places where my mind goes right away with this is to the you know the emergence of AI and the way in which AI was explicitly part of you know the writer's strike. What, what was interesting is that one of the the points of negotiation that the guild would not like, well, that the studios would not move on, that the guild wanted address, but the the studios wouldn't move on. The guilds wanted guarantees. You're not going to just take writer's stuff and feed it through AI. You're not going to, you know, use AI in order to do initial drafts because they know that's just jobs for the writers disappearing. And the studios were like, no, you know, of course we're going to use AI. And I think uh, I, I haven't looked over sort of the final documents, but my recollection is that all the guild managed to get out of them was assurance that you know it'll be a part of a they'll be part of the conversation right now or something that, like that's that. That's all they got. <laughs> I think, they need I better don't think lawyers. Got any sort of guarantee on it? Um, I could be wrong, but my recollection, at least the last I checked in on that, that's all they had was you know we'll have meaningful conversations. That's right. That's, right. that's like the forward. American presidential uh, election. I'm going to be part of the conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That does that does a lot of good. Um, but, you know, I, so I have a sub stack um, that, you know, I don't know if you want to link to it. You can, if, you, if, if, if you'd like to, you can throw it in your description. I'll, I'll, I'll give we'll you add it to the pile. Uh, oh what, yeah, what's let's it throw called? it in. Uh, it's just nathanajacobs.substack.com. And it's where I publish uh, basically letters. People write to me with all sorts of questions, you know, and have over the years on philosophy and, and theology. And I'll just publish on there. I've started publishing those letters that I've written in reply. Uh, and so it covers all sorts of different topics and it's meant to be a little more accessible than you know my usual academic stuff. Um, but anyway, I, I did one on AI and art and specifically the question of whether AI can create art. And my answer is no. It can create images, 
It can even create images that might be in some technical way superior to what it's copying. So, I mean, I use in, in, in this one post where I talk about this, the example of H.R. Giger, right? So Giger is the one whose art is the sort of really weird, gnarly, quasi-demonic uh, mm. stuff that, you know, Alien was based on, right? So, uh, and he actually was, I don't know if he was in, in later you know, movies, but in the first movie, he actually was one of the, uh, you know, production designers, you know, he was actually there on set building stuff and things like that. Uh, because that's essentially what all of his art looks like anyway, right. And so this whole world that's so creepy and unnerving is based on his artwork, which is also creepy and unnerving. Um, but I saw, you know, a series of images of AI generating, you know, Giger impersonations. Now, the interesting thing is, Giger, uh, he is not excellent at anatomy. So one of his weaknesses is that you can see if you're somebody who's very sort of technically, you know, gifted in anatomical art, which I am, you'll be able to see when somebody struggles with hands, for example. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah. They're really trying to hide these hands because they don't like drawing those. Those are tough. And, and Giger has some of those things where, you know, he's very good at what he does, but you can also see his weaknesses have to do with humanoid figures. Um, if they're too close to actual human form, those weaknesses start to show. The more distorted they are, the more you can get away with it. Um, but what was interesting is the AI impersonations did not struggle with that. So in some ways, they were technically superior to Giger because they captured the ethos, but without the defects of, of Giger. So the question is, is that superior? Well, the answer is that it, these are really sort of two different things, right? The one is artwork. And the other is not. And I go through in there some of the, you know, the basic ontology of art, you know, in my own philosophy of art, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's not manufacturing. Um, so to use sort of realist Aristotelian, you know, language, right? You and I are beings who have potentiality within us, right? We have the potential within us to learn how to play the piano or learn how to make art or learn languages or whatever what Aristotle would call first order potentiality, which is that potential that that is more than nothing, right? It's that potential is something, it's a real feature of reality, but it's distinct and less than the actualized, than the realization of that, that you move into being through repetition and habit and things like that. And when you're talking about what an artist is, right? you and I and everybody else who is a rational animal has the potential to be an artist, meaning art, you know, the original word just means skill. There are certain skills uh, that you and I can cultivate. And through that repetition and cultivation, those things move from potential to actuality. They move into being. And once that is cultivated, right? You know, I've cultivated the, you know, the art of drawing, for example. Once that art is cultivated and matured, now that art within me is actually that creative power, right? That capacity. Um, what makes me an artist is that I am one who has cultivated that art, right? And then the expression or articulation of that art, right? That's what we call artwork, right? It's this outward articulation of this inward potency, um, or in this case, actuality. Uh, and so, and so that's sort of a basic, you know, schematic for thinking about what art, artists, artwork is. And when you consider that, then, you know, you talk about AI, well, AI isn't a thing, right, that has that sort of potential, it hasn't cultivated through repetition, etc. So it can produce images, right, but it can't produce artwork. Now, the reason I think this is really important is because uh, this goes to as 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 much as people are wigged out by by AI and how it might affect jobs and things like this. This actually draws a really important distinction. If people can get clear on this, there actually are positive shifts that could take place because we too often in our own culture have manufacturing sensibilities where exactly ex ex the very reason that people go, I don't know, can AI create art is because we tend to think of art as just like some sort of image, right? Something that's been, you know, whether it's manufactured or not. But the fact of the matter is, in terms of ontology, let's pretend we had a, a machine that could take a through within there probably is a machine like this, but you know, um, that could take a 3D scan of Michelangelo's Pieta and then go ahead and create a perfect 
indistinguishable reproduction of it in marble, you know, lasers, whatever it is, whatever it's using in order to bring that about. Are those two statues just identical artwork of identical quality and so on? And the answer is no, because the machine is not expressing some sort of genius of creativity. It's not expressing some cultivated skill of sculpting. So Michelangelo's artwork is artwork. Right, It is the outward expression, the articulation of Michelangelo's unique genius cultivated you know, over time and so on. Uh, whereas this is just a manufactured replica of it. And that's what it is. Now, and that's important because what that means is there is an ontological difference between those two things, even though all the material facts about them are identical, right? So the relational properties, which are not empirically identifiable, unless you're sitting there watching it do it, are what actually make it, you know, the one thing artwork and the other thing not, right? The relational problem to make, um, relational pro property to Michelangelo, to his expression as an artist, to his, his art within and all that. Now, the reason this is important is because I think there's room for manufacturing. You know, I, I actually don't have a problem with the idea that if I'm looking to create a billboard that AI produces it because, you know, I'm not really, am I looking for artwork for my billboard or am I just looking for an image, right? And yet at the same time, we do recognize that if I want art to beautify my home, yeah, I can settle for a print, but we tend to value much more, you know, a real painting. Now, oftentimes those are out of the price range, so you settle for the print, right? You settle for the reproduction because, you know, that other thing, it costs a lot, you know, I don't know. But I think actually there is a potential benefit um, in people through an issue like this becoming aware of what they're getting because you have to ask the question, what do you want? Do you want art or do you just want an image? When it comes to entertainment, do you just want, you know, are you okay with manufactured AI music that you know is just going to make you feel something and lets you you know you know bop in your car or do you want to do you want the art right when you listen to bach is it is it is it bach or is is the genius in the artistry part of what you're there imbibing or is it just you want the notes right um and that matters right since there is a real ontological difference there and so on the one hand, I think, you know, that sort of thing create that sort of distinction and that sort of technological advance creates room for both and in some ways amplifies or creates the possibility of an alternative market, right? An alternative market that says we're actually not here just for, you know, the noises. We're not here just for the image that fills up the space on the billboard. We're here because we actually want art. Right. We want to, to encounter the genius of this sort of thing. So that that's one of the places where I go. And that's what exactly what I see is happening. Now, I think this the strange and sad thing <laughs> with Hollywood is, you know, people obviously love the art of the original Lord of the Rings, you know, trilogy. And a lot of people sneer at the manufacturing of this, you know, of, of a lot of the contemporary Hollywood stuff. And the big question is, if Hollywood goes the full route, which it might, I mean, with AI, I know people who are leaving Hollywood right now in order to create companies to try to make one man band sort of movies using AI and a little bit of, you know, CGI on the top um, to see if they can make it accessible and, you know, direct audience. Um, but the big question is once people, once that, that illusion of art is broken and you take the full step to, yeah, this is just entertaining images and sounds and whatever it's manufactured in the truest sense. Um, is that what you want or do you want art? And if you want art, then there emerges the possibility of a contracted market that says, you know, people are done with binge watching, not everybody, right? Some people will be fine with like, I'm fine with the AI music as long as it, you know, works in, you know, it, in, you know, on the, uh, on the dance floor, which is all I'm looking for it for, right? I'm just looking for a beat, right? Give me a beat, right? Um, and there'll be people who go that route, uh, no doubt, but there, but then what'll happen is hopefully there emerges a clarity in a market for the alternative of, of going ahead and saying, no, we actually want art. So we're going to, we're going to abandon the binge watching 
right? We're, we're going to abandon the sort of mindless intake. We actually want to really engage with the material. And for that reason, we want real artists in the sense of writers, right? People who have depth like Tolkien, right? Um, we want real artists in the sense of production designers and, and costume designers and things like that. And, you know, we want real art in terms of the direction and the care taken with the material and so on. And, and so my hope would be that one of the, one of the things that you'll see is exactly that, right? A sharp rift uh, between manufacturing and artistry. Um, now that might be too optimistic because art gets more expensive in that sense, but you know, I think well, there is a discontent with manufacturing. You know, we're we're a ways down this road already. Once, mm -hmm. once our ability to reproduce, I mean, you, you, can, you can bring this all the way back to the printing press. The difference, obviously, between a copied manuscript and, oh, yeah. you know, the production of the printing press. Uh, people will, um, people have long recognized the difference between a symphony, a symphony that you attend and a recording as we've sort of leveled up our ability to, and, and it's been interesting, it's our ability to reproduce, but it's been interesting how sort of, you know, you have the analog digital mm -hmm. um, okay. war that goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. One of, so as I, as I said before, what, probably something that you're not very aware of is that around my channel has been an analogous conversation with respect to this in that successive younger generations are increasingly, um, I, I'm going to use the same word, they're increasingly cloyed by the reproduction even of of good art let's say mm -hmm. and the desire to participate mm -hmm. because there's a on one hand on one hand there's a million th it's funny when you talked about scrolling i i will I, I will sometimes hand my wife or one of my children the remote and they will start to scroll and then i will i will very quickly get fed up and i'll say I don't care what you choose. What I will not watch is the scrolling. <laughs> that I cannot do. Uh -huh. yeah. So if you really want to choose, it's going to take you a while. I'm going to leave the room. And when I come back, you had better have decided on something. And I will settle in no matter how bad it is. Um, but I think, I think we are, I think we are in a point with our relationship with these reproductive technologies that we, on, on one hand, we have a heightened sense of the hunger for value. And, and mm -hmm. even the word value is such a generic term for we know not what, um, because of the, the, because of the prolific reproduction that has happened all around us. Mm -hmm. and and the fact that increasingly you also mentioned video games i mean the same i would imagine even though i don't follow that world hardly at all i would imagine the exact same dynamics are happening in that world as well there's only so many calls of duty you can make there's only mm -hmm. so many of the and so then people are always looking for the fresh idea and mm -hmm. the, the the fresh idea does something to us mm -hmm. that we have a sense that it isn't the product of manufacturing mm -hmm. it is the product of a world behind the world mm -hmm. and and you know a value hierarchy sets up immediately around the fact that some seem to be some some seem to connect with that world and bring it to us more mm -hmm. reliably than others. And the same goes with their art and their reproductions thereof. Mm -hmm. And, and so when it gets to, I mean, again, Hollywood is a business mm -hmm. and they will be rewarded for 
having a movie that they they didn't spend much on, but they got a big return. That's the yeah. definition of the thing. Right. And and then when people get tired of gatekeepers, now mm -hmm. increasingly they will go to a place like YouTube. Right. And, or podcasting. And podcasting is interesting because it's podcasting is now at the point that uh, the manufacturing killed blogging. Mm -hmm. because when someone says i'm starting a podcast everybody mm -hmm. says well i've got a you know i've got my podcast up and i've subscribed to a few hundred podcasts but which ones do i listen to right, and how right. can i find the new one and then you begin to discover that the the most the most watched podcasts or listened to podcasts the most watched youtube channels sometimes are just schlock you know, they're mm -hmm. just, it's just garbage. Mm -hmm. And you will continue to find treasures out there that are small and obscure and have real value, mm -hmm. but are never discovered or rewarded. In other mm -hmm. words, the existence of the fact that artists starve is not simply a function of algorithm or discovery. There's right. something else to it. Mm -hmm. which of course is the bane of every artist right mm -hmm. because most of them are starving <laughs> <laughs> or at least just getting by <laughs> right 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 so why is that nathan i mean you're... you want me to answer why i want that? you to answer that question <laughs> yeah well i and you brought up gatekeepers and i do think this is is one of the big challenges so i'll just speak from my own experience, right? When well, I well, let, before I talk about yeah. gatekeepers, because this is something I've experienced with having lived in the realm of YouTube for five or six years, mm -hmm. there are physical instantiations of gatekeepers right. who have skin around them that you can talk to them and they're in an industry. Mm -hmm. And then there are principalities and powers that are gatekeepers that only people who like religion and things like that begin to see even have an appetite for talking about. And one of the things that when, once you, once you are involved enough in a, you can call it a marketplace, but mm -hmm. you get the sense that that's not even the right word that again, artists starve for a reason. Right. Yeah. So are you suggesting that when I launch my podcast, it's not immediately going to like blow up or maybe never blow up? Is that what you're telling me? Paul? How's that Substack <laughs> doing? Are you getting, are you getting like huge piles of money from the Substack? I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not getting huge piles of money from the Substack. No, you're right. And yet I'm talking no. to you. Maybe I should, maybe I should wait and find the number one Substacker. I should talk to Barry Weiss. So, you know. But yeah. but this is because once you get neck deep into uh, social media as your um, avenue for artistic expression and reproduction, mm -hmm. boy, are you going to be into this thinking because <laughs> you're going to pour your life into something and yeah. you're going to have people that you value say, wow, that's like the best thing I've read in a long time. Right. And I can't get anybody else else to read it. to read it. <laughs> I've never heard such words muttered in my direction, Paul. Um, <laughs> so, so I would say yes. We can talk about gatekeepers, but let's talk about some of you know this phenomenon that you're yes. talking about. Um, I do think, of course, there are always factors outside of our control, such as yeah, I mean, you mentioned principalities and powers. And I don't deny the invisible hand of both providence and devilry. Right? Like <laughs> they are both, there are invisible powers at work uh, in this game, right? Uh, working in favor of certain, you know, movements or people or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, and also working against them at the same time. And so there's no de um, denying that there are people who have gotten famous because it was the right time for that right event to happen at that moment that happened to catch everyone's attention. And from that point on, they were within in, in you know, the, the public discourse and it just sort of accelerated and compounded. Obviously, that's a, that's a big thing that happens. Um, and so I wouldn't deny in any way any of those factors. And I think they're very real. Um, 
but one of the areas where I, I think, you know, where that I think really matters is there's an underappreciated feature of epistemology, right? How do we know that we know? And um, it's that basically the condition of the viewer affects their ability to see. And so um, this is something that I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate or consider. <laughs> Um, but you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of folks have the experience just uh, to take a simple example of deciding because they like this one band that they're going to learn to play the guitar, right? And so they get the guitar and the first thing they want to learn is that three chord song that they think is the best thing ever written on the planet. And they learn to play that. And, you know, that's, that's cool. They can, you know, grab a guitar at a party and, try to impress people, whether they impress them or not. And, um, and, and then they start to get better and they start to work on it and their skills increase. And all of a sudden that band that they didn't understand why anybody would possibly like starts to appeal to them because they start to understand what's happening with that guitarist. And as they've grown, as they've, as they've cultivated that art and they've changed um, ontologically, They've also changed epistemologically. They can now actually see in the thing things that they couldn't see before, right? And the more they grow, the more that taste and appreciation changes. And so on the one hand, yes, there's a certain baseline, underdeveloped, undeveloped uh, capacity to see things. Nobody looks at Michelangelo and goes, I don't know, is he any good? Right. Like <laughs> it doesn't happen. You might not like it. And again, this is a confusion, another confusion that happens that I'll talk about in a second between taste. Right. And and the actual objective value of the thing. You could hate his sculptures. I don't know why you would, but you could hate them. Um, but nobody's going to say, I don't know if he's that good. Right. Like he's obviously that good. Right. Um, and so extreme, he's a master, everybody can see it. But on the other hand, you'll hit other types of artists where people are like, I don't get it, you know? And sometimes I think that's legitimate. Like I actually do think there is a legitimate judgment to, you know, the backwater hick who walks through and is like, this is art, I could do that, right? And it's like, yeah, he could. And he's right, it's not art, it's garbage, it's a con. Right. Like, and I really do think there's a whole sort of subculture in the art world that really is just that, right. It, it's about being a certain personality and being at the right parties and saying things that sound sophisticated and essentially conning rich people into believing that you're really an artist and, you know, selling your stuff at exorbitant fees. And I say stuff, not art, because that's all it is. Um, and so like, yes, that's true. But then you'll hit certain artists who people don't quite get. And they're like, I don't know, is it really that good? That doesn't strike me. I mean, it strikes me as fine. But then a painter comes in and goes, no, that's really hard to do. Like, I know you don't like the image, but you've got to understand on a te technique level, if you knew anything about paint, that's hard to do. This guy is a master, right? Uh, and that's true, right? Um, and then there's things that are in between, right? Like I actually think Picasso, for example, um, I, I don't ter I don't terribly love his later stuff, right? Um, but the stuff that he's really known for is Cubist stuff. Uh, I don't love it, um, but I've never denied that Picasso is truly an artist because I've seen his work when he was like 16. If you look at his sketches when he's 16, he's basically a Renaissance master. And so in this sense, he has cultivated the art and whatever he's doing, he's not doing Cubism because he can't draw a person. Right. Like <laughs> he's doing this for other philosophical, artistic, uh, you know, experimentation reasons and things like that. And whether it's a good move or a bad move, you know, that's a totally different conversation. But that is one of those things where the underlying ontology, the art, the artist, right, is real. Right. Uh, so that one's not a con. Anyway, I bring this up because because on the one hand, there's there are certain things that when it comes to seeing art, like anybody trained, untrained can see that that's nonsense and they can see, you know, you know, Duchamp's urinal, right? I'm just going to find an object and sign it. They can go, that's nonsense. You're conning me. And the answer is, yeah, you're right. He is conning you. 
Uh, and then, you know, and then they can see Michelangelo. That's amazing. And he's a master. But then when you get in that gray area, the epistemology, right, the ability to see and understand by the person who is not an artist, right? And I don't mean in the cultural sense, but in the true ontological sense that I described before, it gets gray. You're like, oh, this is great. And this is great. And they don't see a difference. But then I'll look at it as somebody who is trained and has cultivated the art of drawing. I go, yeah, that guy has trouble, right? He has trouble with structure. He's fudging a lot. That guy's awesome, right? And there is a difference. I know you can't see the difference, but there is a difference that I can see there. Um, you know, this painter, I know these two paintings look similar to you, but this guy's muddy, right? He, he hasn't really mastered the paint. He's a little uncomfortable with it. This extra guy actually understands paint. And you start to see those sorts of differences. Now, the reason I think that's important is because this feature of ontology doesn't just apply to art. It applies to a lot of other things, including religion, including morality, right? So this was part of the entire principle of virtue ethics, the idea that your ability to see and understand good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and viciousness, it, it changes based on how much virtue you cultivate, right? The more virtuous you become, just like the more artistic you become, the more capable you are of recognizing good and evil in the moral structures of our world. And the same is true religiously, right? The more you tap into the spiritual world, the more clearly you see the fabric of the universe from the spiritual spiritual side. And the reason I think this is really important is because, yes, every now and then, you know, you'll have people who just hit with everybody, right? They're brilliant. They're recognized as brilliant. They're Michelangelo's, yep. right? Yep. But there is a lot of people sitting in that gray, yeah. right? Where they sit there and they say, you know, where people who aren't trained, right, who aren't, you know, haven't cultivated, let's say, you know, intellectual, you know, philosophy and theology, or they haven't delved into the realm of ethics and really sort of plumbed the depths of this and cultivated, you know, those sorts of potentialities or, or your languages or classics or whatever it is, right, literature. Um, they, they sit in that sort of very vague, hazy eyed window of like, I can see really good stuff. I can see really bad stuff, but the gray in the middle, uh, I don't know. And so what happens there is you can have brilliant people who are misjudged as, you know, I don't know what's, what the big whoop is, right? Kind of like the art, like, like the painter where I said, he's brilliant, but you can't tell because you don't know anything about painting, right? Um, and they'll sit in that area or alternatively taste takes over. And this is an interesting thing is that I remember when I would teach on aesthetics, um, when I would start to talk to students about the underlying metaphysics of art, right? About ontology, about art, artist, artwork, and things like that. Students started to intuit, which I would eventually talk about directly, but they'd begin to intuit, if that's true, that there actually is ontology, objective good and bad, better and worse, then that carries moral ramifications, oughts. I ought to like this better than that because it is better than, than that. But I don't want anybody to tell me what I ought to like and ought not to like, even if it's the cosmos telling me <laughs> that I, right? I don't want any of that, you know, I, if I like bad pop music, I want to just like my pop music and be left alone. I don't want to be told that I have bad taste. And yet this is, this is an, that intuition is correct, right? You ought to like certain things more, more than you do. And there's certain things you probably like that you like too much and you sh shouldn't <laughs> like. And incidentally, this is, this is a feature of education that's been lost because Aristotle, when he talks about education, says it's to teach children to like what they ought. Like, that's one of the things that he talks about there, right. which people today are like, what does that mean? Right. What does that mean? And it means exactly that. that there's, there's an underlying ontology of values to this. And so I think, yes, there are these invisible powers and principalities and, you know, providence at work that are, you know, within a struggle that sit behind the scenes that we, you know, rarely appreciate in terms of who becomes famous and who doesn't and who crashes and burns and whose life falls apart, 
I'll, I mean, speaking from my own experience, just as an aside here, well, I mentioned that project that I thought was commercially viable. Well, it was largely related to uh, demonology, right? So I was working with a priest who had worked with the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, uh, who, you know, whose movies, the Conjuring franchise, right? The biggest horror movie franchise ever. Um, he had worked with the Warrens and ultimately saw enough things that led him to become an Orthodox priest. And so I was working with him and I had developed, you know, scripts and all this sort of stuff. And, uh, I will tell you that a lot of demonic stuff happened in my world, both the obvious stuff, you know, like people being pulled out of bed in the middle of the night by things you can't see and the not so obvious stuff, like just strife and things like that. That's sort of infecting a room. And, um, and I eventually bowed out of the project specifically for that reason, because I realized it was such a detriment, not only to my family, but to my own life. Uh, and I hope somehow somebody who is <laughs> better at navigating that than, than, than me will go ahead and make that uh, film, because I think it's well worthwhile. But, you know, like, there are obviously those forces at work. There was a good reason why that stuff happened. And it's not just because I was thinking about it, right? It's because something was threatened by it, right? Um, so yes, those things are real, right? Uh, there is real sort of positive and negative spiritual energy, unless anybody thinks, oh, he's a new age guy. Like energy, spiritual energies are a big thing in Eastern Orthodoxy and in St. Paul. But, you know, anyway, so like, <laughs> so anyway, but so like those are definitely real. But then on the natural sort of level, I think the epistemology factor is a very real thing as well. And the fact that so many people sit in that gray between the, the extreme polarity means that there is a lot of just taste that takes over because they can't really see the differential here. You know, it's like being colorblind where it's like, I don't know, there's several colors. I see two, right? And, and so you, you end up in this sort of this grayed out spectrum with people who are unformed in the areas that they're navigating through the podcast. They're, they're, they're not capable of really seeing the, the hierarchy or, uh, of the content, what is excellent and what is not. Um, and for that reason, and then it just sort of devolves into these other issues of, of taste. What do I like? What do I not like? Um, and that, of course, always leads to all sorts of inverted wonky hierarchies that have nothing to do with the, the underlying reality of it all. So that, that, I mean, that's how I would begin to diagnose a couple of the, the main contributors. So talk to me about, so one of the things that we talked about when we were at the art conference together is you, you'd like to get more involved in, I mean, I'd talked, I'd kind of nudged you in this direction when I talked to you a couple of years, it's been a while since before arc that we talked, that was very early yeah, on in my, it was like three years ago. Yeah. Um, so, so besides sort of the the professional stuff that's that's out there, you also talked about a desire to get more into this popular realm um, mm -hmm. without with with different kinds of gatekeepers, let's say, um, mm -hmm. and and you know I, uh, so what what kinds of things would you like to do? I mean, you've started a Substack here, which I didn't know anything about, so I'm going to have to oh, check see, this out because I that's see you're bad. talking about predestination. For those of oh, you yeah, who, who history, get but... kind of a whiff of this, part of how we know each other is he did Calvin Seminary, decided to do a PhD program, and he went there, and then he became yeah. Orthodox. And you know that's uh, it's, that wasn't that wasn't why the Christian Reformed Church decided to endorse Calvin Seminary to do this kind of thing, Nathan. <laughs> You know, the Christian Reformed Church is having a hard enough time as it is. And here you go and, you know, join the ortho bros. So that's right. That's right. Well, you know, well, for what what it's worth, you know, Paul, it's it, the, the fact of the matter is they were very clear that at the doctoral level, there are no doctrinal commitments whatsoever. It's just pure academic scholarship. Oh, so you should not have said that in the current climate <laughs> of the Christian Reformed Church. I don't I don't think. I don't think Calvin Seminary will see that as a welcome. Maybe nobody else in the Christian. Oh, Church shoot! Will they don't. They don't this. like that. I take it all back. They, they never said anything remotely like that uh, when I was exploring that program. Um, yes, yes, yeah. So the Substack. See, that's how bad I am at promoting it. Even people like you who would would be interested in my Substack, I don't even bother to tell them. Right? You know. That's, um, anyway, yeah. Um, so I, I. 
I've been interested and yes, you you are correct. You actually nudged me about this, not only at ARC, I remember you nudging me about this, you know, the last time we talked before that, which was several years back, where you were telling me about certain conversations having on happening online and, and certain voices in that conversation, but we could really use somebody like you in this discussion who's trained in metaphysics and is actually able to articulate metaphysics in a way that people who aren't trained can understand and all the rest. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's good, Paul, but I'm drowning and, you know, movies about demons and, <laughs> and and so uh so anyway i mean yes there there was definitely that but now i've i've come around to the point of saying like i've seen enough stuff in terms of the the popular intellectual world that even though there are people who um you know i support and i'm i'm very much in favor of and I even listen to um i just recognized at some point that you were exactly right which is that my usual perspective of approaching this as a metaphysician, right? Like that's my area, I'm a metaphysician, um, isn't usually represented. So you'll have people who are representing the conclusion, right? They're sort of working around and through intuitions and, you know, sort of dialogue with others. They're, they're articulating something that arrives in the same place as me, but they don't really understand that what, you know, what they're really sort of delving into underneath it. And as I talked to you at ARC, I talked about that one of the things that I'm absolutely convinced of is that that is part of the problem, is that right now um, we are, you know, having conversations in our culture and we're on different metaphysical planets, but nobody knows enough about metaphysics to even know it. So, you know, they're talking past each other because their first, their first premise is oftentimes their metaphysics. And, and the other person doesn't recognize that that's what's happening and so on. So, um, I mean, I'll just say, you know, I told you at ARC, you know, that, that I'm convinced. Um, well, actually, let me back up here. When I would teach uh, bioethics, I taught bioethics at Trinity Grad School, um, you know, a little bit. And usually I had their physicians in the class, um, practicing physicians who were taking this, you know, just sort of to bone up on, on bioethics or because, you know, the hospital wanted them to study a little bioethics or something like that. And I could always tell, you know, these, these, you know, these guys and gals would come in hoping like, please just give me the magical gotcha on a topic that I can tell my patient or the administrator and they'll get off my back and everybody will be on the, the same page and life becomes easy for me. And day one, my speech to them was always, I've got bad news if that's what you're looking for. That doesn't exist. I can't do that for you and here's why. And I talk about sort of four levels of, uh, of, educate, of, of conversation. So level one is the one where you're dealing in sound bites, you know, uh, you know, it's not a child it's or it's not a choice it's a child right you know or my body my choice or things like that right these are just sloganeering sound bites and then level two you get down to more long-form conversations which oftentimes long-form conversations are dealing in just dialogue about applied ethics right so i'm already got my worldview, I've already got my moral intuitions or my ethical system or whatever. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm just going to talk about what I already believe. Right. And then you're going to counter with, oh, I don't believe that. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say what I believe. And so you're not really talking about the underlying issues. Now, down below that, um, you hit meta ethics, where now you're actually, there's actually a structure to what I mean by the words good and evil, right and wrong. Like I have some sort of understanding, not just of what those terms mean, but how we discern, you know, what things are good and evil and so on. And then beneath that is usually the level of metaphysics, which is how you see the world in general and man and God, if you believe in God, all that sort of stuff, which is what informs how you got to your meta ethic in the, in the first place. And I said, the bad news is in order to really truly have a meaningful discussion, you've kind of got to go all the way down to level four in order to really see where you two diverge. And I said, nobody does that. Well, not nobody, obviously there are metaphysicians, right? Metaphysicists, people like that, but the average person never does that. And so they live at levels one and two, they watch the news and they hear sound bites that they agree with or disagree with. And then they have longer conversations where they're just sort of hurling at each other 
their applied ethics, and they never really get to the stuff underneath it. Um, and, uh, and I mean, just to use an example, um, one example was, uh, I don't know, do I give his name? No, I won't. So it's not, not cause any embarrassment. I won't name who, did, who, who, who was in this clip, but I saw a clip that went viral on Instagram and it was one of these gotcha moments, right? And it was this one conservative guy talking with this one sort of leftist girl and the leftist girl is claiming that I think in order to be a moral good person, a morally good person, right? You need to use another person's preferred pronouns. And the conservative guy was like, well, in that case, my, my pronouns are the guy who is right in this conversation, right? And all the, everybody was like, oh, you know, gotcha, right? And, uh, and my reaction was like, okay, I get why that works on the internet, but if you really wanna have a meaningful conversation, the response probably should have been, okay, well, you brought up morality and goodness. So maybe we should have a conversation about what you mean by the word good and bad person, what you mean by morality, how you discern those, what your underlying understanding, not just of those are, but how we discern those, what the structures of morality are, uh, our, your epistemology of morality and so on, so that we can actually figure out where we're really diverging. You know, I'm a natural law ethicist. I'm guessing you're not. So, you know, what are you and where do these come from? And the fact of the matter is, my guess is if that was the response, the gal would probably be a deer in the headlights because she'd probably be like, well, I don't really know, right? Like so many people in the culture, she just functions on vague moral sentiments, right? And so she just sort of feels like that's probably true. And you actually deepen the conversation if you start to have a conversation about, well, maybe we should actually examine those words and examine how you got there and how I got to the alternative place, you know, that I am. Uh, and so that's really what I wanted to do with, with um, well, I'll, spoiler alert, right, with my podcast. So I wanted to move more into this space of speaking directly into the culture, like, you know, people like yourself and others are doing, where you're entering the, the public square, you're having the public conversation direct to the people in terms of, you know, YouTube and, you know, Spotify and whatever else, right? Putting out the, the podcast, but really trying to engage these topics in, in a way that is sort of unique to how I navigate them, which is oftentimes a little different uh, than the way other people do because I'm a metaphysician. Um, so that's sort of like the broad issue is like, I actually thought about naming it level four specifically because of that, but it's just going to be the Nathan Jacobs podcast. I mean, I, like, I know that's, that's really creative. And when you think of me as a creative, as an artist, obviously you would expect something as far outside of the box as that as possible. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. So the Nathan Jacobs podcast, that's really sort of the focus of it is that I want to examine topics everything from you know things like ai and can it make art or you know whatever the 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 public discourse is you know going on you know there uh to things like what's the right direction for the toilet paper and let me examine this as a metaphysician uh you know <laughs> <laughs> so like no i mean but there it really is that sort of thing and a big theme that runs through it is the theme that i mentioned to you at arc which is that i'm convinced that the most important issue in the history of ideas generally, and that is still the most important issue today because it sits underneath the massive cultural divides is the question of realism, nominalism, which is exactly what you mentioned. All right, so for anybody who doesn't know, right, realism is basically the question of saying, I look out into the world, you look out in the world, every human being by default looks out into the world and we see structures, right? We think in terms of genus, of species, you know, you know, animal, human, common properties, bipedal, or, you know, that ball is red and, and that ball is red, whatever it is, um, as well as these abstractions like numbers and, you know, logical sets and things like that. And the question is, when the mind looks out and it does that, I can't stop doing that, it always does that. When it does that, um, does it do that because those structures are real and it's abstracting, pulling out of the world? structures that are really there and identifying something that's real if you say that you're a realist right um or is it that the mind just needs to organize things and so these are mental fictions 
that it projects on a world that really isn't organized, right? It really isn't that it's broken into these sort of genus and species and common properties. These are all just sort of mental fictions to impress order, to impose order on a world that really isn't that way in itself. And if you say that, that's nominalism from the Latin nomen for names. They're just a bunch of names. And what I'm convinced of is that virtually every hot button issue in our culture right now is a rift between people who are intuitively realists or people who are intuitively uh, nominalists. And so, you know, it, the most obvious contemporary example is the trans debate, where the first premise is, well, gender is a social construct. Well, that's a nominalist pre premise, right? That's no small pre premise. What you're saying is it's just a name. It's just a mental invention. We put it out there. And then for that reason, if we manipulate reality and then give it a new name, well, it is that thing because, you know, it was never that thing in itself and it's in the first place. So, you know, yes, we call that lump of cells a penis, but if then we chop it apart and we make it look like something else and we call it something else like a vagina, then all of a sudden, you know, it is that other thing. And on the other side, there are people who are intuitively realists who are like, I don't think that's true. Like, I think it actually is a penis. And I think if you hack it apart and reshape it, it's just a hacked apart penis. It's still that thing in itself. Well, so right there, you have a realist and nominalist divide, but nobody knows that that's the divide that's happening. And, and yet it is. And, and that's why that's no small thing to expose that and say, we should actually look at it from this perspective, because your first premise is a first principles premise, right? The, you, the first thing you have to do when exploring metaphysics and worldview is decide this fork in the road. And I, that's why I say it's the most important uh, question in the history of ideas, because I'm convinced the best way to look at the history of ideas is just a history of exploring realism and a history of exploring nominalism. All the different topics are sort of subsets of that, that question. And so you see it there, but I think you also see it. It's, it's been less obvious, but no less present in things like abortion, right? Whether it really is a human being that has all the rights and stuff, even if it doesn't look like it yet, or, or whether it becomes that at some point, we name it at that at some point. I think it's there in things like feminism and the question of are the family structures and the hierarchies that, you know, society has tended toward because of differences between men and women, are those real? Are those social constructs that can be sort of disassembled and things like that? So anyway, I, I see it across, across the board in all these topics. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, a central theme within this, this podcast that I'm going to launch, and we'll see what it involves, you know, evolves into beyond that. But at least right now, just, just a podcast, um, is, is that theme and trying to draw that to the surface and in drawing it to the surface, offer a more sort of metaphysically refined and precise exploration of different questions. Well, I, the challenge to me is, well, there's a number of challenges that I see as a pastor. Number one, the, the movies, the podcasts, the art, the reproduction, mm -hmm. all of this is the deep formation that is happening that is happening and continuing to happen at an accelerated rate in our culture. Mm -hmm. We we came out of a world in which people were formed by, let's say, the natural rhythms of their environment, uh, harvesting, sowing, um, and and then also the church, the the liturgy, the, the all of this, the art of the church, all of this stuff formed. A civilization when you talk about the fact that people they might not have any clue about what these words mean right and we talked about it with respect to art but mm -hmm. everyone is in fact all being formed they all mm -hmm. have a map inside and they have a first draft map that has been deeply formed by their parents has continued to be um, tweaked and altered all along and and when there are major transitions in that map sometimes we'll call it a conversion or a transformation or something of the something of that kind and so the Whereas in many ways, the church had a a good the church the church had a a rather preeminent place in human culture for a very long time, which yielded uh, this culture in the West uh, that we currently participate in. 
but the the need for uh, the need for continual formation and also you know i've i've often you know i've spent 6 years doing what i've been doing and in many ways people will often ask me what exactly are you doing and i'll usually say i'm still really not sure um which is terribly bad after 6 years and at my stage in life i should have an idea about what i'm doing but you know for for me i think the more i get into this increasingly it's about trying to trying to help people be effective in terms of understanding each other and 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 actually providing a a context by which they can be productive mm -hmm. and, and that's that's actually tremendously difficult mm -hmm. and and art and its powers have a way of sort of forming beneath the the waterline of consciousness mm -hmm. and and we see i mean that's part of the power of art and so therefore good art and people have known this in our culture and have dared to say it. And today, if you say it, you'll often be dismissed or sneered or hated. But mm -hmm. um, art has had that power and, and, and hence both the incredible need of having good artists who are forming the culture and the people in good ways. You know, it's a tremendous mm -hmm. need. And given the fact that we do economics is an aspect of culture and industry is a part of our world. You know, there's going to, you know, artists can't, artists can't just say, I do my art. Well, okay, right. there you go. Right. <laughs> right. Maybe 500 years from now you'll be discovered and uh, God bless you <laughs> for what you've done. Right. And, and you've, I mean, you've, as an academic, you see often that some of the people who, had excellence in their field were recognized at the time. And therefore we know them because they've been celebrated ever since others mm -hmm. were never celebrated, but somewhere right. along the line, someone discovered it. And there was enough of a community that looked at it and said, Oh yeah, that, that we should pay attention to that. Right. Um, and all of those dynamics continue today. So I, I do very much want to see, um, I want to see you both continue to do your work, you know, sort of in the, in the industry, let's say, I think that is vitally important. Part of what I think we have sensed seeing these supposed gatekeeper-less flat structures of social media is that, um, oh, actually, um, really good gatekeepers are actually very valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you when you find an excellent gatekeeper that can sort of say yes to this and no to that, and therefore use their position in a hierarchy to push things up and mm -hmm. have things come about. That's a blessing from God. Yeah. But um, as with everything, there are some gatekeepers who do better and some gatekeepers that do worse and some all gatekeepers have bad days. So, right. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited that you're, that, that you want to get into this because I do see that, most of the people that I bump into in church mm -hmm. are farmed, formed far more, at least initially by television and movies and radio and newspapers. Mm -hmm. And now today by social media, they're formed far more by this than many of the things that churches and clergy are doing. Mm -hmm. And and I don't say that to encourage clergy to abandon their posts. No, mm -hmm. you you have to in fact stay there and just actually you, you're you're dealing with a an environment that is far more competitive than it was 800 years ago. Right. Yeah. So basically, clergy have to up their game and really figure out what they're doing. And clergy, like everyone else, are only are, are mostly sort of intuitively tied to things they know now. They know not what, and hopefully most of those things will be of some use and some goodness. So, right, yeah. I so I think I think you're right. I think there's there's a lot of challenges here. I'll I'll just state a few broad ones before I go back to specifically the gatekeepers and the art art side of things that you're talking about. I mean, I think we underappreciate you know the level to which um, we are shaped our 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 
you know, our cognitive framework is shaped by pre-volitional stuff. So people like William James noticed this, where he's like, look, there's certain things that if you pitch them to somebody, they're live options and they're dead options. And it's not always because of some rationale, it's pre-rationale, right? It just doesn't sound right to them, right? And you'll see this all the time when, when uh, people like, you know, uh, well, I mean, Joe Rogan for a long time, although there seems to be a shift now, was just like, it was like anything but God, right? Like God, ah, it just doesn't seem plausible. It sounds like nonsensical, you know, myth and fairy tales, you know, but aliens as an explanation, like totally, right? Absolutely. Uh, and you see this all the time in, in different things, like in the sciences, right? Uh, dark matter, right? People will be like, yeah, absolutely dark matter. And then you're like, okay, so, so how did we get to this conclusion of dark matter? Well, the answer is there's a missing mass problem meaning the way bodies out there are moving, uh, there should be more mass than we can detect. So there must be some mass that we cannot detect, that we cannot see that's changing the way in which they move. Now, the thing is, if I made that same argument, but I switched out dark matter for angel, people would go like, ugh, it's so stupid. And I'm like, what? It's moving. It's not moving, you know, the way it should, you know, given the, how much mass is out there. So there must be an invisible hand. I'll call them a celestial hierarchy of angels. I'd be like, that's ridiculous. But there's no difference in the two arguments other than the word I used at the end of it. And one sounds more sciencey than the other one. And so we're like, yeah, dark matter, obviously. We all know that's real. And then it's like angels. That's stupid. Right. And and that just speaks to what James is talking about, these pre-volitional sort of, you know, one is just live option to them, one is dead option. And people oftentimes mistake those pre-volitional impulses for reason, right? There's actually nothing rational about that. That's, that's really just sort of taste. And that's shaped by your culture. Um, and so there's a lack of appreciation for the fact that most people who, you know, have, a, let's say, a, a, an evolutionary narrative, which is really what Darwin wanted, right? This is yep. a creation yep. myth, yep. right? For for Darwin, that's what it is. It's a creation yep. myth. And they don't really sort of realize that it's a creation myth because for them, it's just science, right? It's just what we know. But most of them actually don't know too much about the theory of evolution. It's just the cultural myth in the culture that they live in. And so everything that presumes it sounds plausible, right? On the face of it. Um, and so it's not rational, it's pre-rational. Um, and then with that, you also have, you know, people like Peter Berger, the sociologist, his book, Rumors of Angels, he talks about the same thing, the fact that you're a social animal. And so in many ways, you know, what you come to know or believe is plausible or implausible is based on broad impressions of what most people think, right? What right. most people know, right, to be true. It's based on that. Um, and if you translate somebody like an anthropologist into a different culture, all of a sudden they're tempted to go native because now everybody else knows something else is true, right? And and that's not to say that there is no place of reason. It's to actually say reason is really important because it's the thing that can come into that conversation and look at the pre-rational stuff and assess how rational it really is. Um, and so now I say that because I think uh, for a long time, there's been a myth of secular neutrality, especially in the United States, that's been able to thrive on this, right? We all actually had, we, we underappreciated how much we had been shaped by the church, by, you know, Judaism and Christianity, that's there in the founding, it's there in the enlightenment, it's passed on uh, to, you know, to the, the founders of, of the US, even if many of them were deists, right, it was still just there in the culture of the United States. And so even when people abandoned Christianity, they still lived in a culture that had boundary lines set by the instincts of Judeo-Christian religion. Um, and so in many ways that allowed us to say, well, obviously we can talk in non-religious, secular, neutral terms about these arguments because like, who's going to ever say that, right? And yet, as we've seen it, you know, dissipate, those fumes of Christianity dissipate, what we see is those boundary lines get further and further and further out, right? So again, to use the trans thing, like 20 years ago, everybody would have balked at the idea anyone would remotely consider that. And certainly the idea that you know that anyone would ever think that hacking apart your child's genitals is like a good thing and like for their for their good people would go that's insane i don't care who you are nobody would ever believe that 
And I think that's because 20 or 30 years ago, the fumes of Christianity were still pretty strong. They were creating this invisible boundary line that, you know, and then as they start to dissipate, those boundaries get further and further and further out. And so we underappreciate just how much our culture and our, our common cultural reasoning has been shaped by whatever, you know, myths and stories and, you know, things like that, that we tell. So early on, we had this underpinning of a broadly common Judeo-Christian, you know, mythology. And here I'm not using it as necessarily false, obviously. I'm just saying like that was the sort of broad cultural sentiment about morality, about the universe and things like that. Atheists were weirdos, right? Like that was just, you know, the way things were. And what we're seeing now is as those are dissipating, now new myths are setting in, right? Evolution is the primary myth. You know, the priesthood is, are the scientists, right? And this is all incidentally by design. You look at people like August Comte and others, like they were like, that's what the movement toward utopia is. You're supposed to engineer that and slowly replace, you know, the liturgical calendar with, you know, political holy days, right? You know, uh, you're supposed to replace the saints with, you know, the white coats and the scientists and all that, you know, and so on. Uh, so it's all by design, but we're as we're starting to see one, you know, one influence, invisible influence dissipate, we're seeing all these other things. And then you add to it the storytelling, whether it's through movies or television or music. Um, and then you add to it, you know, these other sorts of things like as you move towards self-actualization, right? New sentiments that say, actually, I shouldn't even, you know, try to shape my child. I should let my child shape themselves and things like that. And now it all begins to accelerate. And obviously the internet accelerates it as well, because if you're talking about, you know, like Peter Berger talks about, as I mentioned, the, the sort of, the, this sort of cultural influence, right? He talks about the phenomenon of being a, a, a cognitive minority, where if I, discover that I'm in the minority and on opinion, I either go silent, I abandon the belief altogether, you know, or I, I proselytize and proselytizing is the least likely because you're a social animal and that's dangerous. So more likely you go silent or you abandon it. Well, social media has the ability to create impressions of what everybody thinks just by scrolling for a few seconds, right. um, just by likes and dislikes and things like that. And so now you actually have algorithmic tools to socially in engineer those, you know, impressions. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why you're seeing those accelerated narratives happen. And I think, I think in order to address that, yes, you need parents stepping up their game. You need pastors stepping up their game. But you also need to address, you know, the myth of cultural neutrality. You have to get into the storytelling game and create the counter story that's there. There's a lot of big scale things you have to do because this is actually a big scale game. It's not a small scale game. Now, the challenge, of course, you know, we, we haven't talked much about gatekeepers, uh, but you're right. There are good and bad gatekeepers. And then you also have to talk about patrons. So I'll talk uh, first about the patrons part, right? You know, in, in the days of Michelangelo, to be a patron of an artist for his entire life was not that expensive, right? I mean, yes, you had to give him a salary. Yes, you had to, you know, it, you had to, you know, pay for supplies and things like that. But like the cost of making a sculpture versus the cost of making a movie is is quite different. And if you're talking about multiple movies over lifetimes, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the idea of finding a patron to support an artist was once more realistic when the artist did paintings, right? Movies are multi, multi, multi million dollar endeavors every time. And so you run into this problem of bringing together, you know, patronage with business. How do you make it sustainable? Because it's not sustainable if it's all just always, you know, donations or something like that. And so this is where I'd really like to see, and I'm, I've actually sort of taken the lead in my own world now to try to engineer this. You really have to figure out a, a sustainable business model that's also mission-minded. If you want to tell certain types of stories, you've got to find out, an, you've got to find an economic way of doing it. Now, what you also need is you need to find people with money who appreciate the mission side of it. And for that reason, they're like, okay, I'm willing to direct significant resources toward the storytelling, but we're not going to do it in a stupid way. We're going to do it in a way that is sustainable. So we're going to marry the business with the mission side. And, you know, right now I, I have my own endeavors, you know, along those directions. If there's any multimillionaires out there who want to talk to me, you know, <laughs> um, 
No, so I, I Nathan I, A. I, Jacobs. I, Substack. Com. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, you know that. <laughs> um, yeah, hit me up in the comments, right? Uh, so, <laughs> no, I'm um, so. So, yeah, I mean, I think you do have to figure out a way to do that. And I think that's a worthy endeavor, not just art for art's sake, but because you realize you're in a battle over story, yeah. right? And you need to tell the better story through the means by which people tell stories. So I think that's the sort of financial patronage side of it. The other side is the gatekeepers. And on the one hand, there are a lot of bad gatekeepers right now. Um, I, you know, I was, I was talking to you about, you know, about uh, certain certain projects that I've heard about, right, um, <laughs> that have run into problems with gatekeepers. And, uh, and, and we, we see this all the time, right? We see this all the time when we're talking about, you know, a movie, a studio that had like three, all the studios except for one passed on this project and then it blows up and everybody's like, how could they pass on that? It's so good. <laughs> the answer is because none of them are creatives. They didn't, they didn't see it, right? You only think it's good because you got to see it, right? None of them are in the head of that, you know, writer or director or whatever. Um, and, and oftentimes that's part of the buffoonery that happens in Hollywood. I mean, you sit here and you imagine, like, let's pretend that before Tolkien's book goes to press, we're like, you know, we need to make it more commercial. You know, let's grab this guy over here and that gal over there. Let's put a room together to scrutinize this thing and, you know, maybe see if we can whip it into shape. It's too esoteric, you know, too layered. Too, people aren't going to be able to understand this and they start to mutilate it. I mean, we it would be outrageous. It, it'd be quite literally insane. And yet that happens in Hollywood all the time. And, and honestly, for myself, that's the flip side of the coin when I talk about trying to find a way to sort of make it business viable to push my own stuff into the public sphere unmolested is exactly that is right. that i'm sitting here going i'm encountering time after time after time gatekeepers who have no business being gatekeepers yeah. molesting my projects and so there's these walls between me and the audience that's actually part of the appeal of what you do you get to just go to the audience right yeah i, but, I get to i get to Good, bad, right, or wrong. It's all out there. And it's have at it, folks. There. there is a comment <laughs> section and people do know how to type. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, and incidentally, I mean, that's that's part of what's refreshing for me about Substack. I don't have to go through a publisher. I don't have to go through gatekeepers. I just take this letter that I answered this question. I put it out there, right? Like, it's just out there. Um, but on the other hand, as you pointed out, good curators good gatekeepers are invaluable so you get somebody who is tolkien like or something like that somebody who actually can identify underappreciated talent and they give them the doorway right they open the door for them to go out or you know you know they're able to actually put together teams that do make people better it is true that writing rooms and artists coming together can make things better it can make them worse often does because of the current machinery machinery in place but it is true that there are brilliant writers and artists and things like that, that when brought together can enhance things. Yeah. Um, and I've experienced both sides of this, right? Yeah. I've experienced people who were a bear to work with and were perpetually dragging down the quality of my material. And I've seen people who I happily relinquish the reins because I'm like, you're brilliant in your area, which is not my area. And that's great. Like, let's move. And here's just my few notes on what you do. And so what I want to see, and I think is really important, at least in the film side of things, is exactly that, is that what you need to do is you need to come up with the business model that is able to offer smart patronage, where it's like, yes, we're going to be wise and use business savvy in how we utilize these do dollars in order to make it profitable and sustainable. And I have my own model for that, um, that I'm working on bringing into existence right now. Uh, and then you also need to have good curators, right? Good, good artists who you can bring together so that you can elevate people who, you know, need that push out there, give them the support that they need, as well as provide means of enhancing what they do and making them better than they would be otherwise. So that's sort of the two edged sword, but, you know, and, 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 but that's, that's exactly that, that good version of all that is exactly the same thing that. I'm trying to accelerate and hope that in the next couple of years we'll actually be real and active. So, well, and I, I think it requires, it requires community. 
And mm-hmm. it, re- you know, when you Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien would never have done what he did without the Inklings. That's and right. and people can name. Usually, people get to three Inklings: Tolkien, Lewis. They might know Barfield. And then mm-hmm. it sort of trails off from there. Yeah, who's the um, art guy, right? And things like that. <laughs> yeah. But it's, but I, I think, I mean, ideally a good, I don't even know the nomenclature in Hollywood, but it, having, a, having a good community that mm-hmm. can listen to each other, test each other. And, you know, and again, gatekeeping when it's sort of, goes down it's when to encourage when to and how to discourage in a productive way um pointing out you know yeah more of that i mean it i mean lewis of course was you know yeah, more more you know more 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 of those elves you know <laughs> and of course in the 1930s and 40s who was going to write about elves <laughs> that's right that's right but yeah. but but then finding and then developing the the spirit between those people that that this thing can actually uh go somewhere because yeah. of course i mean part of the as a preacher where you're where you're putting out something every week you, mm-hmm. you begin to you begin to become accustomed to the fact that so, some things some of the things that you love really aren't very good you just love them <laughs> <laughs> Uh, other other things that you think aren't very good maybe have some promise in them and and there is and and sometimes things that are good land flat here but eventually go and right. it's a very it's a very interesting dynamic the way these things that we create sort of have a life of their own and mm-hmm. then work their way in the midst of all of the other lives that we are mm-hmm. that that we are living among yeah so yeah. yeah, and and so I I don't know for me the I've actually found that social media and in, in the case of YouTube for me, if if handled well, can actually be be a place where you can find a community and get um and have a nice and and have a venue for which because a venue for which you can actually discover something of value because right. so often it's the case that. You put out so much stuff that mm-hmm. you know what 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 uh what of what I've put out is any good. The only right. way you know that is by feedback, right? And having people that are and you need a whole community of people. Some some people might be very developed and well formed. Other people might be sort of along the way, but mm-hmm. with that with that mixed group, you can begin to say okay. So that yeah. communicates well to these people, but not over here. And and I think again, the cultural challenge is to, as you said earlier, to to try to elevate people's tastes because one person's one person's elevated tastes might become the platform that another person sort of comes in on as their first draft. And that in fact is how over time you actually improve a culture that Mm -hmm. all of the people have a sense of yes, no. So your gatekeepers get better. The parents Mm -hmm. get better. And, you know, that's, that's basically how you improve a civilization. No, I think you're right. I mean, on the social level, it it expands in that way. The sort of microcosm on the creative level that my mind goes to is Pixar, early Pixar. Yes. So the entire early Pixar process they spent so much time in development, storyboarding every scene, scrutinizing every scene, trying to make sure that there are Easter eggs everywhere, bringing in people who are obviously working on the project, but people outside to to hear the pitch or to see the things. And, and it went through so much rigor, partially because you have to render it. This is one of the interesting things. I actually think <clears throat> some of the best directors um, in Hollywood, were oftentimes animators or that animators sometimes who weren't even directors were some of the the sort of best intuitive directors because you look at for example the contrast between let's say like the new live action beauty and the beast or something like that and um and you take like gaston's like basically you know uh his riot song right where he's gonna you know rile everybody up 
and you contrast the performance with the animation. And what's interesting is, you know, put aside the voice quality of the different actors and who's a better singer and things like that. If you look at the minute direction of the animators, right? As the cartoon character is playing this, right? It's all about these hands and these wild facial expressions. And every moment of every appendage is thoughtful in terms of how it's played out because the animator has to literally draw every frame. So they're yes. sitting there going, what should his hand? And if you watch Disney animators back in the day, they would have mirrors and they'd sit there and be like, what does it look like when I go, mm, right? And then they, mm, okay, well, okay, right. And that's how they would do it. You know, they'd look at their hands and, you know, examine how that expressively comes out. And obviously it's exaggerated, it's a cartoon, but you know, in many ways, it was far more meticulously directed and thought through than anything you get in live action. All of a sudden you get to live action, he's just sitting there singing and you're like, who directed this? Somebody who clearly hadn't thought through every beat and every moment and every word and what they mean. And they didn't provide that direction to the actors and things like that. And you look at those older things, um, you know, uh, they, they did. It wasn't just the animation, it was the voice actors that they would sit there and talk through every line on and all that sort of stuff. Um, and obviously there's with animation, because it's slowed down, you're building every frame, you're building every line, you have a certain luxury to meticulously build like that. But that really is the job of a director, right? Yeah. When you're sitting there to, to get the actor to understand and, and manifest that on the uh, on screen. And so I think what you see is that animators, because they have to be so meticulous, they actually do think through every detail. They have to build the room that you're, they're going to be in. So they think about Easter eggs and they think about the architecture and all the things they can slip in there. And I think that comes through in the Pixar process that they spent so much time on development, which is rarely financed in Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood, you like a concept, you got a script. All right, let's do it. Right. And you're into pre-pro uh, as opposed to saying we're going to spend months on development and meticulously scrutinizing the story and bringing in other artists who we respect, right? Not just rando voices. We're bringing in artists who we respect, directors who we respect to get their outside fresh perspective. And we're taking that into account. And I think that's why those early Pixar movies were so successful because they spent, they had that community that you're describing. Yeah. Now what you're describing is expanding that, you know, yeah. expanding that out into a broader culture where now it's starting to be, the things that you're, the conversations you're having here expand then into the churches, into the political sphere, you know, into the artistic and the musical sphere, into the comic book sphere, whatever it is. And I think you're right that 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 sort of microcosm as it grows into a macrocosm is the sort of thing that that does create change. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should we should land the plane. Um, sure. My phone is my <laughs> phone is uh, people are leaving me messages. Oh, okay. life, life goes on out there. There, there are there are church people that have demands on me um <laughs> well that's right paul you're a pastor i, I, I forgot about that. <laughs> i know i i am not i am not just a a a rather unsuccessful youtube celebrity um <laughs> i just do that in my spare time <laughs> well what what would you like to so we got your sub stack do you still uh -huh. have your website? You had a website before. That's how I first found you. I did. You know, it's a little dated, but it is still there. You can you can find it. So it's nathanajacobs.com. Okay. You need the Don't a forget in the there. A. Yeah. Uh there was there was a couple of reasons I needed to include that in everything. One was because I taught at University of Kentucky in the philosophy department for a while. And there's another Nathan Jacobs at University of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> he was in computer science. So I would get like invitations to conferences <laughs> to speak on like computer science. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sign me up. Um, and so there was that. And then I think there was also like a, uh, a, a America's Most Wanted, who was a Nathan Jacobs too. That So in order to, uh, it's not me in case anybody's curious. Uh, sure well, you do is. have those tattoos. Sure Did you get those is, right? in that's, prison? That's, Maybe an Orthodox right. prison. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So anyway, so I had to include that. So everything is Nathan A. Jacobs. If you're looking at my publications or searching me online or whatever, that'll narrow it down. So um, yeah, I've got my website, NathanAJacobs.com. You can see there samples of my artwork. You can see there, you know, some some information again, dated. Like for my first two movies, I don't I don't think I've put anything up related to the newer stuff. Um, you can also find a catalog of academic publications, which will trace to my academia page where I tend to post PDFs of all of those. So you can read them if you want. Uh, and then a little bit of about the Substack, as I said, is where I publish stuff that's most meant to be more accessible. And now I, I do think it's still a little deep waters for, you know, for folks who maybe aren't accustomed to reading philosophy or theology, but I try to make it rather accessible. And then Nathan Jacobs podcast, the, uh, the Nathan Jacobs podcast, that'll be coming out here soon. I don't know if this will be up by the time it's out, but um, maybe maybe if that's up, you can point people okay. uh, to that. Throw that in the heap as well. More, and if not, just- Podcast on the pile. That's right. If not, just you know, search me from time to time. And well, see what was the name of your document? I did Becoming Human, but then I got a bunch of oh, monkeys with sticks. Right, right, um, right. No, Becoming Truly Human. Truly yes, you, Human. Right, yeah, you get monkeys. <laughs> You get monkeys if you keep out the truly, and then truly you get me and and a bunch of religiously unaffiliated folks. There so. it is. I really right. like that. I thought that was a. I, I thought I thought it was a great documentary. I, it was. Thanks. I appreciate. I, it. I think it really. The tone was right. It was. You know, with this therapeutic culture, you, you in some ways you 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 sort of have to start with that door, and then right. once you develop a degree of credibility, then you can kind of. You have to have a pretty firm found American, you know, Americans are so they're such flighty little creatures sometimes, you know, they can't take a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. Even, Fair even enough. though, even though the world is pretty doggone cruel um, right. sometimes. So, yeah. Well, the other thing I will say, if people are in, aren't interested in my theological letters, what they can do is there is a post on there called for those who like podcasts. Uh, and so there's a table of the contents pinned to the top. You can always navigate the, the site going there. And so if you find for those who like podcasts, I actually just cataloged all my different podcast appearances and, and put it up. So that oh, okay. with hyperlinks and things like that. So that's everything for me on, you know, on here with you to like closer to truth, the PBS show and things like that. So, okay. And there you go. All, all right. right. Beautiful. That should be more than enough for anybody who's curious about me. Well, I will be very interested to hear after you've gotten into the weeds of podcasting a little bit and uh, seen where it's gone. Um, you know, don't you know? Feel free to send me a text when you get. So, Paul, listen to this podcast because I'm okay. I, I'm a gatekeeper of such. I've I've, be, I've become sort of a gatekeeper. That's um, good. I, I it's good to know a gatekeeper. Well. <laughs> You, you'll be surprised who comes through that gate sometimes because after I post this, they're definitely going to be coming. So um, okay. I must Fair warn enough. you. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Look, uh, you know, as a guy who went to art school, lived in the slums of Baltimore, grew up in Chicago, have has lived in Kentucky and, you know, taught philosophy and religion and now in Hollywood. I mean, nothing surprises me anymore, Paul. I, well, I feel like I've met them all. <laughs> Well, well that's good. We will see. <laughs> we will see. I've got right, I've got a number see. of very interesting critters in in the menagerie that's sometimes called this little corner of the internet. So okay. we, we, we will see. we will see. We will see. I'll let you know if anything surprises me along the way. I'll be sure to do that. That sounds great. Well, yeah. Jacob, it's great talking to you. And right, um man. yeah, keep in touch. I'm anxious to see where this goes. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, for having me. All I'll right. talk to you soon.